I want to start by saying some things sincerely, hopefully from my heart. Um, I'm really honored to be here tonight, in the next couple of days. I'm humbled to stand in front of you and uh, But I'm excited about what I believe the Lord is going to do in our hearts the next few days. I, this may sound like a cliche, but I really have sensed for some time that this is going to be a divine appointment. And I'm just glad that I'm going to be able to have a little piece of that and participate in that for my own heart, not as a speaker, but as a, as a recipient too. But uh, I believe this is going to be a divine appointment. Um, I just came from the desert. That sounds like the desert father and mothers, doesn't it? But uh, I, I just came from the desert. And um, I was in a little church of about 100 people. And I told the Lord at the end of that experience, <clears throat> if this is the way you want me to spend the rest of my life, it's really okay with me. Uh, we met God in the desert. And the fresh wind of God blew, uh, not just during the services, but in my hotel room all day long. The wind of God just blew on me. And I could honestly say that I'm, I'm not here discouraged. And I could have easily have come discouraged as a speaker, and that's a bummer. Um, but I, I've come refreshed because the wind of God just really blew on me in a little city out in the middle of the desert somewhere with a hundred little folks. And... Uh, I'd rather participate with God in a divine appointment with 10 people than be in the largest church in the land and it not be a divine appointment. Yeah. And I mean that sincerely. Uh, I felt like this is weird, but I, I wanted to throw this out. Dave said, I, I have a word for you. And, and I don't say that a lot. Uh, if you know me, I don't say this is a word of God to you. But I, as Dave said, I believe this is a word for someone. It it's going to be worth it all. And that sounded like a word for somebody or for several. Uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to say a different word. I was in the shower this evening and I felt like the Lord just really climbed in the shower with me and, and uh, said, uh, this is a word. Uh, and it's a strange word. Uh, but the word is, is this. And I don't even know if I have good words around it, but I'll give it my best shot. Uh, Needs are our friends. That's my word to you. Needs are our friends. I hate needs, don't you? Don't you hate to feel needy? I hate to feel needy. I fight needs. Sometimes I'm ashamed of my needs. Sometimes I hide my needs. But if I know anything about needs, needs are our friends because needs are the doorway to God. You don't pursue God if you're not needy, most of us. That's just part of the human condition. Needs are friends. So if you've come pretty needy this week, you're in a great position. And I don't say that lightly, and I don't say that flippantly. Because I know needs are painful. Uh, when you are emotionally hemorrhaging, it's not fun. So when I say needs are friends, I don't say that glibly. I, leave with, I live with a huge need. It's called cystic fibrosis. I've lost 85% of my lung capacity. I travel with 156 pounds of equipment. I strap to a breathing machine three times a day. My life is hard. It's hard. I have one huge need physically that just munches on me like cancer. But it has been the most incredible, redeemed doorway to God for me. It's been incredible. God has redeemed it. God may one day in his sovereignty choose to heal me, but you know whether he does or not, he's already redeemed cystic fibrosis. He's walked right into the middle of that ugly, nasty disease and shouted at it, I'm the redeemer. I'm going to take all this ugly, mushy stuff, and I'm going to so redeem it for good. The enemy's going to be really sad he deposited it. I'm going to make him pay. And that's the truth. He's redeemed it. Uh, I'd be glad for him to just take it all away, but... He, I, I've even come to this conclusion, and I, I'm just rambling for a little while, but uh, I, I've come to this conclusion this year. I don't know what's best for me, folks. I don't know what's best for me. Do you think you know what's best for you? I bet you don't. I bet you don't. 
You know the only person who knows what's good for you? It's God. He's the only one who knows what's good for you. And he said, no good thing will I withhold from them who walk uprightly. Do you know he's not withholding anything good from you if you're walking uprightly? So if something's in your life right now that's really a hairy need and it's suffocating you, it might be a good thing that God's allowed to be there to just let you know him in incredible ways. I hate words like that, don't you? <laughs> but it's the truth. The one truth that sustained Corey Ten Boom in Raven's book. Do you know apart from Raven's book, Corey Ten Boom would just be a little heavy set lady with wire rim granny glasses and her hair in a bun and nobody would know about Corey Ten Boom. But do you know because of Raven's book, her need, she learned the truth. There is no pit that God's grace is not deeper still. And she's blessed the world. Excuse me? She's blessed the world. That's big. So what I'm trying to say to you through this word tonight is maybe you've come with a certain pair of glasses about your need. Maybe you need to put on a new pair of glasses. That need's there. And again, I'm not minimizing and trivializing the need because for some of you it's painful. But I want to tell you that need can be an incredible doorway to know God in a deeper way. And if you get to know him in a deeper way, it will be worth it all. It will be worth it all. I think one of the reasons maybe the Lord has given me a platform to just share with people across the country is that I'm just so needy. I mean, polio, cystic fibrosis, being weird on my best day. Uh, I, I'm a needy man, but through those needs, God has been so faithful to let me get to know him in some neat ways. And it's out of those wounds and out of those needs that he has shown himself strong. And I get the opportunity to brag about him. Well, I'd like for you to take your Bibles tonight. If you brought them, if you didn't, I like you anyway. But if you brought them, I'd like for you to turn to 2 Corinthians 4.16. 2 Corinthians 4.16. <clears throat> I'll read that verse in a, in a minute, but I'd like to just kind of introduce where I want to go tonight and tomorrow night. Uh, this topic has been in my heart for about the last year. Uh, my deal is I don't have, it's not about sermons for me, it's about passions. I got a lot of sermons, but I don't have tons of passions. But I want to talk with you about a passion tonight that I have. It's more than a sermon, it's a passion. And the passion is this. Um, in the last year, I've been caring a, just a whole lot about people like you, more than ever, in terms of this phrase, restoring our spiritual passion. I want to talk with you about restoring your spiritual passion this week. Now, I know Gordon McDonald wrote a book on that years ago, and he's probably forgotten more than I'll ever know about restoring your passion, but I want to give you what I got. 2 Corinthians 4.16 says this. We've sung about it. I love that song, Refresh My Heart. 2 Corinthians 4.16 says this. Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, he had to be at midlife when he wrote that, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. I am being refreshed, Paul said. I am being renewed. I don't renew myself. I'm being renewed. Now, I posture myself, but God does the renewing day after day after day. And do you know why I do that? Do you know why that's critical? Because if I don't, I'll lose heart. I just got two options. Be renewed day by day or lose heart. That's my only two shots. There's not a whole lot of middle ground there. Well, that's what I want to talk about, restoring our passion, having our inner man or woman refreshed. Another synonym would be experiencing a fresh touch from God. Same thing. Rekindling our first love. Same thing. Different words. Restoring our soul. Same thing. I mean, I don't know which phrase connects with you, but I'm going to use the skeleton and put the meat on the skeleton of restoring our spiritual passion. 
I was thinking the other day, I, I look back over 25 years of ministry, and I wrote down some of the things that I've done when I first started as far as titles and positions. I've been a church caretaker. I've been a worship leader. Did you even know that, David? That's a scary thought for you, isn't it? I've been a worship leader. I've been a youth pastor. I've been an associate pastor. I've been a teaching pastor. I've been a lay elder, and I've been an itinerant speaker. All of those different roles in the body of Christ in the last 25 years. And yet it didn't matter of these seven different roles that I've had in the last 25 years, the primary calling was the same. The primary, the, the heart of the job description in any of those seven roles were, were the same, and the heart of the job description in those seven roles basically was this, to be a spiritually passionate Christian. I mean, that's the heart of all of those. I believe in ministry, the greatest thing you and I have to bring to the table, so to speak, is a, is a spiritual passion. Do you know if you're a spiritually passionate person, you can do tons of things wrong and yet be incredibly effective. Doesn't that bless you? That blesses me. I mean, I think I could write a book on just absolute insane mistakes made by Dave Busby. It'd be a big book. And yet I believe by the mercy of God there's been some effectiveness through the years because there's been passion that the Lord has implanted and sustained and maintained through the years. If that spiritual passion is leaking through your corpuscles, you will impact people in significant ways even if you're goofy and do a lot of things wrong. And you know what? You can be the slickest, most gifted person in the world. But I want to tell you what, if you are not a spiritually passionate person, I don't think you're near as effective as you might think you are. You might wow and zow, and you might put the glitz on, and people might be influenced, but I don't think they'll be greatly impacted. I heard this cliche, Morris caught than taught. More is caught. You've heard that. More is caught than taught. Many times our lives impact people in the unintentional versus the intentional moment. I've worked a lot with kids in the last 25 years, and that's true. I've interviewed kids now who are married and have three or four kids who were seventh graders when I was their pastor. And as I reflect to them and I say, tell me about a... Oh, thanks. Tell me about a, a, a time somewhere in our ministry... Stretch if you have to, where you felt like you were impacted by the Spirit of God. And always going into that conversation, if I remember that young person very well years ago, I would be thinking, well, I bet it was here at this camp, or well, I bet it was here at this revival, or I bet it was here, I bet it was here. And do you know what I've noticed in 25 years? Not one time have we ever matched up with the same event. As that young person would tell me where their lives had been impacted, I mean, my mouth would fall open because I would think that had been probably the last thing I would have chosen, which again goes to prove so many times when a person's life is impacted, it's the unintentional moment versus the intentional moment sometimes. I think more is caught than taught, and I'm talking about a life on a life. I was stunned when kids said, Boy, Dave, if you want to know where the Spirit of God through you impacted me, let me tell you. And I was stunned when they told me that. And again, it confirmed the fact it was the spiritual passion leaking through that impacted. It was the life of Jesus blowing through that impacted and not as much the teachable woman. What I want to say to you again to be repetitive is I think the greatest thing you bring to table in ministry is your spiritual passion. If that's true, I want to define what passion means. I mean, if, if that's the truth, and I believe it is, Let's define what passion is, and then let's think about how God's Spirit can sustain that passion in me. The word passion basically means to be affected by. That's what the word means. Whatever I feel passionate about affects me. If you feel passionate about golf, and I've met lots of people in ministry. I don't, what is it about golf and ministry? 
There's something that's, that's a connection there. It's a mystery. <laughs> I've met lots of people who are passionate about golf, which is a real okay thing. But you know what? Golf affects them. It stirs them. <coughs> <coughs> It moves them. Well, if I'm talking about a spiritual passion, obviously I'm talking about being affected by, being moved by, being stirred by Jesus and his truth. He affects me. Consequently, I think the greatest challenge in ministry, and I'm just talking my experience in 25 years, I think the greatest challenge and danger in ministry is this, that we would lose our passion. That we would cease being affected by what used to affect us. Does that scare you? Does that terrify you? That you and I can be so around the most powerful, life-giving, incredible truths of eternity and somehow they cease affecting us? They stop affecting us? That terrifies me. Where my heart would get disengaged, where I'd go through the motions, where I would live a cliche, where my life would just become words, it would just become rhetoric. Where I'd just be on automatic pilot, where I'd be lukewarm, apathetic, or as my hero Barney Fife says, apathy. You ever been there? You ever lost your passion? Has your life ever become a cliche? Mine has. You ever become apathetic? You ever just put it on automatic pilot? Where you're just going through the motions, your heart's disengaged? I've been there. And when I cease being effective, affected, I become ineffective. That's a big statement. When I cease being affected, I become ineffective. Tonight, if you find yourself in that scenario where your passion is low or your heart's kind of disengaged or you're kind of on automatic pilot, uh, maybe where you're going through the motions, if you've come to this conference this week like that, well, I want to say to you, the very last thing that I want to do is make you feel like a jerk and make you feel defective. That's the last thing I want to do. What I'd like to do, energized by the Spirit of God in the next couple of days, is to really jumpstart your passion. I'd like to stimulate your passion. I would like for you to be freshly affected by Jesus and his truth. And for those of us who are around it a lot, that's a big, that's a big order. That's a big order because we've heard it all. And for it to start affecting us in fresh ways, that's a big deal. You know, some of you, I realize you've come to this conference and you're pretty full. You're pretty passionate. I mean, you really are in high gear. You're feeling good internally. Well, I want to deepen your passion too. Do you believe it could be deepened? I guarantee you it can be. Well, how, how does it happen? Well, tonight I want to deal with one thing, but I'm going to spend a couple of minutes. Pardon me if you've heard this before, but I, it's the best thing that I can do to illustrate it. I, there are two or three things in it, it, that God's been showing me that's absolutely critical if our passion is to be ignited and sustained for the long haul, and sustained. But these two or three things that I want to share with you this, in these next couple of days are things that you have to experience. It's not just information, it's revelation. It's not just information, it's experience. 
the longer I'm in ministry, the bigger of the gap that I see exists between a truth and experiencing a truth. The Holy Spirit not only guides us to the truth, He guides us into the truth. Into the truth. Now let me illustrate. Pardon me again if you've heard this, but it's my best shot using an earthly story to illustrate a heavenly truth. When I was a kid growing up in Nashville, uh, I had an older brother, older sister, younger sister, still do, matter of fact. Uh, have, have a wonderful mom and dad, both are alive, mid-70s, saw them last week. Uh, my dad is a bald-headed, ex-Dale Carnegie optimist. You know, I grew up staring at my corn flag, flag saying, act enthusiastic and you'll be enthusiastic, you follow me? Wonderful dad, fun guy growing up with my mother. <clears throat> She's kind of the double-knit queen of the universe. But I tell you, I love her. She's a godly woman. Matter of fact, my mother is more like Jesus than anybody I know. And I know a lot of godly people. My mother is more like Jesus than anybody I know. I respect my mother more than any person on this entire planet. And I know a lot of wonderful people. My mother's an intercessor that nobody knows about. But when she goes into her closet and gets down on her double knits, things in the heavenlies happen. I'm convinced the reason I'm here and almost 45 years old with cystic fibrosis is my mom's prayers. I'm really convinced of that. I really am. Um, <clears throat> however, when I was growing up, my mother was a wonderful southern cook with the exception of two meals. These meals were on the edge, but one of these meals was the meal from hell. <laughs> now, my mother and I talked about this as recently as a week ago, and we have two opinions, and they are not the same, okay? <laughs> but I'm going to use my mother's vernacular. My mother, the, the meal from hell, and I put that in quotes, was Thalman Croquettes. <laughs> Thalman Croquettes. I'm not exaggerating when I say we had salmon croquettes at least 50 times while I was growing up. At least, that's not evangelistically speaking. I mean 50 times we had salmon croquettes. Now my older brother, my older sister, my younger sister, myself, loved, honored, respected mom, still do, didn't want to hurt her feelings. She was a wonderful cook with the exception of the two, big exception on the one. So when we were in the midst of salmon croquettes, we, were, had, we had serious indigestion, I mean, we're pulling bones out of our mouths, sticking them under the plate. It was a scary experience. Fifty times at least in that experience, my mom would notice that we were less than blessed. And she would basically start the lecture. Some of you can identify with this the same way. She'd start it the same way. She'd always start with the question, Don't you know that children are starving. Her particular continent was Africa. Africa! You know, I heard, I heard that truth. And I believed her. I mean, that was the weird thing. Even as a small child, I believed her. I believed the fact that little children were starving to death in Africa. I believed her. I never wanted to say, Mom, let me, let me give you a time out here. I'd like to make a little interruption here. I believe every kid in Africa is fat. I don't believe you. I didn't do that. You know, the truth was, I believed my mother when she said little children are starving to death in Africa. Fifty times we talked about it. I never hooked up starving kids in salmon croquettes. I never saw the hook there. I think the subliminal message was, be grateful for salmon croquettes, you ungrateful kid. I think that was the subliminal message. Ten years ago, however, here's the point of this insane illustration. Ten years ago, my wife and my daughter, who was eight, went to Africa. And I went to the Mathari Valley in East Kenya, Nairobi. And for the first time in my life, in a cardboard village with 500,000 Africans, I smelled the truth that little children are starving in Africa. I tasted 
the truth that little children were starving in Africa. For the first time in my life, I held little children who were starving in Africa. For the first time in my life, I experienced what I had believed all along. You know what happened when I experienced it? It affected me. We changed the way we spent our money. We adopted 10 children from Africa. Am I saying that to do this? No, I'm saying that to say it affected us. When you experience something, it affects you. So when I talk about several truths this week that we need to let in to ignite and sustain our spiritual passion, these aren't mental checklist, memorize a verse a day kind of things. These are experiences. You're going to need the Holy Spirit to guide you into these truths. Because you know what? In the ne- tonight and tomorrow night, just in this particular... Uh, focus, you're going to already know what I'm going to say. And your temptation is going to be to say inside. You won't say it to me necessarily. Inside, you know what you'll say to me? Oh, I know that. Well, little children are starving in Africa. I knew it too. But here's how you'll know you know it. How deeply does it affect you? Because if it deeply affects you, then you just might know it. I want to deal with one thing tonight that we've got to face and we've got to taste and we've got to drink and we've got to embrace and we've got to experience if our passion is to be ignited and to be sustained. And I'll tell you, when I give this truth, and I've been given this truth on Sunday morning in real polished white collar, fancy, hot to trot church churches, and I'll tell you, it's the most terrifying message I've ever preached. It's terrifying. What I'm going to share with you tonight is just absolutely terrifying, just because it's so heavy. I, what I'm getting ready to tell you tonight is so heavy. And I, I'm, I'm sitting in the back before I go out on the platform, and I'm saying, now, Lord, tell me again, this is what you want me to say. You know, one of the interesting side notes, the scripture calls people like us stewards. Do you know what a steward is? It's a table waiter. It's a waiter. And do you know what I know about table waiters? They don't prepare the food. They go into the kitchen, they get food from the cook, they try to bring the food out from the cook in as much of the condition as the cook prepared it to get it to the table. I don't see any waitresses going out going, "Mm -hmm." I think I'll throw this, let me just sprinkle a little bit of this in. Especially if it's a nice restaurant. Some restaurants, I wish they would do that. <laughs> but in a nice restaurant, hey, the chef prepares the food, the, the steward, the table waiter, tries to get what the cook prepared in as much as close to the condition as the chef prepared it on the table. So when I give this heavy stuff to you, you know what? You're going to sit down to a feast But, whoa, it's going to be heavy. And I've had to keep rechecking and rechecking with the cook. Because what I'm going to give you tonight does not sound like this would be the first step toward igniting and sustaining the passion. It certainly doesn't sound it to me. But the more I've preached it, the more I know it's the truth. And the more I've let it in my own personal life, the more that I know it's the truth. Well, come on and say it then. Well, I want to say it. For you and I to ignite and sustain for the distance our spiritual passion, the first thing we need to taste freshly, we need to experience deeply our personal depravity. Our personal sinfulness. Well, Dave, thanks for sharing. I spent money. I'm discouraged in coming. 
Thanks for that good word. And you're calling me depraved. Are we ready to pray so I can go back to my hotel room now? Let me ask you a question. How long has it been? Think with me. Think with me. Think with me. How long has it been since you have been staggered by, arrested by, immobilized by indwelling sin? In you. You know, I don't even want to argue over titles of, now wait a minute, am I a saint who sins or am I a sinner? I don't even want to argue that, that issue. But what I want to say to you just point blank is this. Do you know enough indwelling sin survived even when you met Jesus that it's enough to work on for the rest of your life? Do you believe that? Call it whatever you want to. You're a saint whose sin, there's enough indwelling sin, there's enough depravity left in us as believers and as pastors and wives. Post-cross, post-resurrection, post-Pentecost, there's enough depravity left to really keep us broken and humbled. Believe. How long has it been since you've not just said, for all have sinned, but since you've said, boy, for I've sinned? How long has it been since you've said from your toes, I am a saint, but oh, wretched man that I am. Do you find that interesting that the most spiritual man, in my opinion, in the entire New Testament, cried out, O oh, wretched man that I am. He knew more about the in Christ truths than anybody in the New Testament. When I look at Paul's journey in humility, he starts out by saying, I'm not even worthy to be apostle, to be an apostle. He ends up by saying, I'm the chiefest of sinners. Do you know what Paul understood, ladies and gentlemen? He understood all the in Christ truths, and we're going to be talking about some of those. But do you know what else Paul really understood? He understood depravity. He really did. Let me get back to this question. Now, would you be honest with me? How long has it been since you've been immobilized with a personal awareness of your depravity? You've been, you, you've been taken down for the count. It's taken your breath away. Your indwelling sin. Can I be as bold as to say this, hopefully with gentleness? I bet for some of you it's been a while. I don't know if I agree with this, but listen to this statement. In the last year, I haven't read too many modern books. I've read a lot of books by saints that are two, three, four hundred years old. I find it interesting that they didn't write any books until after they died, and then somebody wrote a book about them. While we're living, we write 25 books. Do you smell a dead fish somewhere? <laughs> and they were martyred. One of those older saints said this, the greatest sin in the church today is that we've lost our sense of sin. I don't know if I agree with that, but it's an interesting thought. The greatest sin in the church today is that we've lost our sense of sin. Here's the quote of the night. C.S. Lewis. Boy, he was a real spiritual lightweight, wasn't he? I say that sarcastically. He was a dear man of God. Listen to C.S. Lewis. Listen to what he said. The true Christian's nostril, the true Christian's nostril is to be continually attentive to their inner cesspool. How long has it been, and I don't mean to be crude, but I want to use that metaphor, how long has it been since you've smelled your inner cesspool? Took your breath away, took you down for the count. Here's another saint of God. This was written 300 years ago. Listen, this guy got it. 
This guy got it. Listen to this statement. Even wash our tears of repentance in the blood of Christ. He writes. Let's chew on that a minute. Even wash our tears of repentance in the blood of Christ. You would think when we're broken with tears dripping right off our chin, that'd be our highest, holiest moment, wouldn't you? This saint says, even at that moment, wash those tears in the blood of Christ, because in our holiest moment, we're still defiled. In our holiest moment, depravity is right there in our face. I've thought about the times I've been the most broken with tears dripping off my chin over my sin or selfishness or lack of love or lust or greed or covetousness. Fill in the blank. <clears throat> you know, even with my tears dripping off my chin, my repentance has even been a mixed bag on my best day. Because a lot of times my tears of repentance are about fear of being caught. It's about... That sin even makes me feel more bad about me. It's not that it grieves God as much. That guy got it. I love what Larry Crabb, the illustration, pretty vulnerable illustration. Larry Crabb said he was out on the beach one night. He was walking, had a time of brokenness, sitting there weeping. And right there in, the, right there in that holy moment, he thinks, boy, this is going to be a good illustration <laughs> at one of my seminars. See what I'm saying? I want to attempt to answer this question. How could our conscious awareness, our attentiveness to the intercessible, how could that be a good thing? Could that be a good thing? How could that be a good thing? I hope you don't mind me reading a few quotes. This was written by St. Teresa of Avila. Imagine that. A woman. I say that sarcastically. Thank God for godly women. Listen to St. Teresa of Avila. She understood the value of self-knowledge, meaning an awareness of her depravity, our depravity. Hang in there, stretch yourself, get this. This path of self-knowledge must never be abandoned, nor is there on this journey a soul so much a giant that it has no need to return often to the stage of an infant and a suckling. In other words, we need to keep coming back to our awareness of our depravity. We need to never totally forget that. Self-knowledge is not only foundational, but also a foundation that can never be forgotten. We're to come back to this most basic way of prayer over and over. In attempting to explain to us the value of self-knowledge, Teresa adds something that sounds to us quite strange. She writes, along this path of prayer, <coughs> self-knowledge in the thought of one's sins is the bread with which all palates must be fed, no matter how delicate they may be. They cannot be sustained without this bread. How startling to think that our own sinfulness can be the bread by which we are fed. How can this be? But when I think about, come and eat at the banquet table, one of the dishes on the table is the fresh awareness of my depravity. That doesn't sound like it needs to be in amongst the vegetables, does it? That doesn't sound too nourishing. Get that off the table, I want to say. We must not deny or ignore the depth of our evil, for paradoxically, our sinfulness becomes our bread. When in honesty we accept the evil that is in us as part of the truth about ourselves and offer that truth up to God, we are in a mysterious way nourished. Even the truth about our shadow side sets us free. There is therefore no need to repress, suppress, or sublimate, I don't even know what that word means, any of God's truth about ourselves. Full, total, 
unvarnished self-knowledge is the bread by which we are sustained. A yes to life means an honest recognition of our own evil, but it's also a yes to God. Again, I want to attempt to answer this question. How could being consciously aware of our indwelling sin, what's left of our depravity, be a good thing? Let me give you four things a knowledge of your depravity will do for you. And all four of them are wonderful. Number one, it will break you. It'll break you. Boy, I'll tell you what, when you see with no pretending allowed your personal depravity, it will break you. And Jesus said, blessed are the broken. Do you know between the Old and New Testaments there were 400 years of silence? And after 400 years, God starts speaking again. Do you know, I'm curious to say, I, I'm curious to hear what God's going to say after 400 years of silence. I kind of want to know what's the first thing out of his mouth. You know the first significant thing out of God's mouth after 400 years of silence? Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the broken. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. It was the theme of brokenness. Folks, nothing breaks more than awareness of my indwelling sin and my fight with depravity. Nothing breaks me more. That's one thing depravity does for me. Second thing depravity does for me is it frees me. It not only breaks me, it frees me. You say, frees me. What do you mean it frees me? When I realized that depravity is not just a concept, it's not just a topic, it's in every corpuscle of my being, it frees me up from this sick works theology. Because I'm going to tell you what, when you see how depraved you are, and I am, and our world is, all of our little worksy things to try to get right with God or stay right with God melt into oblivion. As a friend of mine says, cheer up, you're worse off than you thought. <laughs> Boy, that's truth. Cheer up, you're worse off than you thought. I like that. I'll tell you what, the more I've walked in the last year in just the unvarnished acceptance of my depravity, it has more and more freed me up. I'm freer now than I've ever been in my life. Because you know what? My only hope of righteousness is the gift of righteousness that God gives me for free. That's my only hope for righteousness. But folks, I'm going to tell you what, until we... Until we're so convinced that that cesspool has pervaded every corpuscle of our, our being, we'll try to do this works thing. We'll come strolling into the presence of God on the basis of our good works. We do that as Christians. We come with confidence into the throne room of grace based on how well we've had a quiet time. Did we witness to our neighbor? Did we not lust today? Do we give sacrificially? We come and stand on the basis of our flimsy works. We do that. We feel far more welcomed, far more accepted, far more confident when we've had a good day than a bad day because when our depravity has been in our face and it's totally stripped us and left, left us naked and bleeding and wounded, we crawl into the presence of God and we say, well, God, if you hear me today, I guess it'll be because it's grace. And he says, that's the reason I heard you yesterday, too. <laughs> you know, when you came strutting in, because you did all these good things, it's a throne of grace. And by the way, this is going to stun you, but you're just as welcome today as you were yesterday. Folks, I want to tell you, the Christian in the pew in your church doesn't get that. Do you hear me? They didn't get it. There's more works theology that's defiling and annulling grace than we ever know. But I'll tell you something that'll, it, that'll pull the plug on it more than anything else. So I want to tell you what, when we realize how absolutely depraved we are, 
Folks, that little works theology will shrivel, will shrivel up and look as impotent as it really is. This was written in 1780 by a Scotsman, Robert Haldane. Listen to this commentary on Romans. He's talking about the righteousness of Christ. To that righteousness is the eye of the believer ever to be directed. On that righteousness must he rest. On that righteousness must he live. On that righteousness must he die. In that righteousness must he stand forever before the judgment seat. And in that righteousness must he, must he stand in the presence of a righteous God. That righteousness. Why? Because of our depravity. The good thing when we see and smell and taste our depravity is it frees us up from a works theology. The third thing it does, and boy, this is good. This is good! It not only breaks us with people. I'm talking about you and me, folks. I'm talking about you and me. Not our congregation. I'm talking about you and me. When we are ever attentive to that inner cesspool, it breaks us. Blessed are the broken. It frees us from a works theology and a works righteousness, and we're riveted onto the righteousness of Jesus. We're riveted there. But the third thing it does for us, this may sound a little redundant, but it's worth being redundant, it humbles us. I got a friend of mine who really gets this thing of his personal depravity. This is great. This blessed me. I was in my friend's presence when someone came up to him and said, you know what? I watched you do something and I just really don't like it and it really hurt me. And I just couldn't believe you did that. You know what my friend said? Because he gets his personal depravity. He gets it. He's experienced it. He looked at that person and he said, is that the best you got about me? That's the bad thing you see? How much time you got? I know a lot of worse things than that about me. He didn't defend. He didn't rationalize. Do you know how much energy we spend defending and rationalizing, folks? Trying to put our best foot forward, making sure we're seen in just the right light. You know what it shows? It just shows we had not seen our depravity. I had a guy confront me recently when I went into town with him. And because I have cystic fibrosis, I do have special needs. But he saw me being demanding. And you know, maybe I was. Uh, he, sh he saw me kind of acting like a celebrity versus a servant. And I had this tendency to say, Oh, first of all, well, second of all, well. And the Lord just said to me, man, he didn't see the tip of the iceberg, did he? You know what I wrote that brother back? I'm just telling you how this has affected my own personal life. I wrote the brother back and I said, you saw a part of my depravity. Have mercy on me, dear brother. Please forgive me. Well, I tell you, when we see and taste our depravity, it humbles us. We can get off that terrible treadmill of always trying to make sure people see us in the right light. Here's the fourth thing, and please let this in as ministers and ministers' wives. It not only breaks us, it not only frees us, it not only humbles us, but it qualifies us. Hebrews 5.2, listen to this. You say, what do you mean it qualifies us? Well, listen to Hebrews 5.1 and 2. It's the Old Testament system, but, but there's some application for you and I. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men and things pertaining to God in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Verse 2, listen to it. He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided. Why? since he himself also is beset with weakness. And because of it, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sins. As for the people, so also for himself. Now obviously Jesus has offered our sacrifice. 
but the principle of dealing gently. Folks, nothing in the world qualifies us more to work with sheep, wounded sheep, sinful sheep, depraved sheep, more than smelling our own cesspool that makes us gentle. Makes us gentle with others. Do you know what I believe the least characteristic of a follower of Jesus is? Self-righteous. I don't think you can get further from Jesus in terms of degenerated character than being self-righteous. Those are the toughest people Jesus had reaching. They were the thorn in his side, so to speak. Hey, prostitutes love Jesus. He's a friend of sinners. Tax gatherers scrambled. It was a self-righteous crew that he struggled with the most. And he had some pretty strong things to say to them. How long has it been since you've heard about a sin in someone and out of your mouth or in your mind were these words, How could he have done that? You ever said that? You ever thought that? Then that's a little Alamo City sign blinking in your face. You hadn't seen your depravity as deeply as I want you to see it. Folks, do we really believe that we are capable of anything? That our flesh is capable of anything? Do we really believe that? I don't believe we really believe that. Priests are gentle. You know why? Because they've smelled their own depravity. Let me read a quote by Bonhoeffer. This is one of my favorites. Don't miss this one. Wow. Bonhoeffer said, Anybody who lives beneath the cross and who has discerned in the cross of Jesus the utter wickedness of all men and of his own heart, will find there is no sin that can ever be alien to him. Anybody who has once been horrified by the dreadfulness of his own sin that nailed Jesus to the cross will no longer be horrified by even the rankest sins of a brother. Does that mean we don't discipline people? No, absolutely we discipline people. Does that throw accountability out the window? Absolutely not but it sure brings gentleness in the window. This is the one thing, what? Awareness of my, our depravity, that will save us from ever being offended in the confession of another. It forever delivers us from conveying an attitude of superiority. We know the deceptiveness of the human heart, and we know the grace and mercy of God's acceptance once we see the awfulness of sin, we know that regardless of what others have done, we ourselves are the chief of sinners. Therefore, there is nothing that anyone could say that would disturb us. Nothing. By living under the cross, we can hear the worst possible things from the best possible people without so much as batting an eye. Whoa. If we live in that reality, we will convey that spirit to others. They will know it's safe to come to us. They know we can receive anything they could possibly reveal. They know we would never condescend to them, but instead understand. There's an old pastor friend of mine that I worked with for a number of years said, to me, by the time I confess my own sin, it's about time to go to bed. Are you convinced of this in your own heart? Are you convinced of the depravity of your heart? How long has it been since you've experienced a fresh taste of the cesspool, a, fre a fresh nostril smell of the cesspool? Well, David, that sounds like a downer. Well, it is, but I'll tell you, it is a downer. But it's a wonderful downer. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. It, it, it's life that comes out of death because it'll break you, it'll break me, it'll free us, it'll humble us, and it'll qualify us. We'll be gentle. We'll be safe people. 
Are you a safe person? Are you a safe person? Could people come to you and really talk their guts with you without fear that you'd be condescending? Because they know you faced your depravity. When Jimmy Swaggart fell, did you do a, did you do one of these? How grow a camel? How did you do one of those? Might have been a real good reflection of your heart. I'm taking a risk here, but so what? Some time ago, I was I was empty. And I was really tired, and I was really sick of the ministry, and I was in an empty plastic hotel room, and the thoughts of selling cars began to be more and more appealing to me. Dave's Car World. I was sick physically, I was frustrated, I was taking... uh, a particular drug at the time to help open up my lungs. It was called prednisone, and it incredibly disturbs the sleep pattern. So it's 3 o'clock in the morning, and I can't sleep. And I'm just so sad. I'm lonely. I'm missing my wife. And I look at over at the television in this particular hotel room, and it's got those in-room movie things with the buttons on them. Now, right now, most of you want to say, just to cover for yourself, oh, really? What could he be talking about? I was pretty hormonal. Been away from my wife a while. I walked over at 3 o'clock, as I remember, and I premeditatedly pushed button number 6. I didn't accidentally stumble across the room and my elbow bumped into the button. No. With an act of my will, with foreknowledge, with absolute intention, I pushed button number six. And I saw one of the vilest, slimiest pornographic movies, or part of one, that I could ever imagine. After a few minutes, I don't know how many, I turned it off, I laid in bed, I began to weep. And I said, well, Lord, that's about as far from what I want to be as I could be. And then all of a sudden, I'm talking about being aware of my depravity. And it was like slapping a tar baby. All of a sudden, I began to think not only about losing the battle to lust, which I did. I started thinking, I wonder if that was billed to my hotel room. (laughs) That's a great situation, isn't it? itinerant evangelist watching dirty movies in a hotel room on the church's bill. This is where I began to go down for the count because I began to hear my cesspool bubble with thousands of rationalizations of calling the front desk saying, I accidentally pushed the button. There was a wrong movie. Could you take that off my bill? Liar! Liar! You didn't accidentally push the button. You premeditatedly pushed the button. Bubble. Bubble. Well, maybe I could, maybe I could, maybe I could, maybe I could, maybe I could. I was stunned. I was stunned. I was staggered. I went down for the count with not only losing the battle to lust, but I lost the battle to even deception, the deception that was coming out of my soul. Finally, I said, now I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to face the music. That's what I'm going to do. And I did. And I dealt with it.
there's some of you that your particular, particular bubble of depravity is far from that. And as much as you don't want to, you're sitting there going, boy, David, Dave Gein, was Dave your only choice to be able to speak to us? Could, are you sure about this? You must have a real narrow speaker list here, bud. And you know, there's some of you that's not your battle. And it's not my battle all the time. But occasionally it is. But you know what I know about you before you judge me too far? Is you've got your own brand of bubble in your cesspool. And it might be covetousness, and it might be materialism, and it might be selfishness, and it might be envy, and it might be jealousy, and it might be lovelessness, and it might be judgmentalism, and it might be self-righteousness, but put it down, it's there! It's the truth. I went down for the camp. I want to answer another question. I'm not going a lot longer, but this is real important. How could our depravity and experience of our depravity be a good thing? But here's a big question because I don't want to let you out of here without dealing with this one. What do you do? What do you do when you smell the cesspool? What do you do when you smell the cesspool? Well, let me give you four potential responses when you smell the cesspool. <clears throat> One is just to do what Adam and Eve did. It's just run and hide. Just run from it. Hide. Another word for that is denial. Man, when that bubble of the cesspool comes, you just say, whoa, I can't believe that piece of indwelling sin is in me. I can't believe I'm that petty. Just denial. I mean, they ran and hid and they looked for leaves to cover themselves. I mean, I, last week, or a couple of weeks ago, I was speaking at a youth pastor's conference with 3,700 youth pastors. I'm sitting in the lunch, uh, in, the, in the restaurant of this hotel. I don't have a name tag on. I'm enjoying my lunch. And this new little guy sits at the table beside me. I think it's probably his first convention. He looked like he was probably 19 years old, and he was just bubbly with all that New Zealand. Oh, hey, 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 hey. And he was an extrovert off the scale. <laughs> so I knew a private lunch was out of the question. And he looked over at me and he said, Hey! He said, You here at the convention? I said, Yeah. He said, What do you do? I said, uh, I travel and speak. Oh! He said, well, I just came to this church. He said, a little church. We don't have a handful of kids in the youth group. But you know what? Maybe if you give me your card, I'll call you and let you speak at my church. Maybe. Blue. And you know, you know what the bloop bloop was that time? Because he said, oh, are you attending the conference? And I'm embarrassed to tell you this. I'm embarrassed to tell you this. But it was all I could do to not say, attending the conference, I'm speaking at the conference. But buddy, it bubbled. And you know when it bubbled, I didn't even I didn't even want to face it. I didn't want to get face with just how sick that was. And I thought, David, I'll tell you what, buddy. You're not worthy to speak to somebody on a street corner. It's God's grace and mercy. Let you even get up in the morning, man. 
Your ministry is not something you achieved. It's something you received. When you, when you hear the bubbles, like in the big water cooler, but it's coming from your flesh or indwelling sin, do you run and hide? Or second, bad strategy, do you blame it on somebody else? That's Adam and Eve. God, let me explain the situation here. It's this woman you gave me. It's Eve. Well, I tell you, we live in a, we live in a blame it generation, don't we? It's this dysfunctional family. <laughs> Folks, you know what? I, I believe there are a lot of wounds coming out of dysfunctional families, and I'm not making light of that. And we need to hold folks' hands and walk them through the blood and guts in that. But I tell you, after, after all the dust settles, after all the dust settles, we can't point the finger and say, it's them, it's them, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. No, we can't. Ultimately, somewhere, we'll have to take personal responsibility that regardless of what they did to us, it cannot permanently destroy us when the grace of God is available. With my wife, it's just a little more sexy. With my lot more wife, just listened a little more. It was tender. Blame it, blame it, blame it. Pass the buck. Third one, and this is again a little redundant. What do you do when you smell the cesspool? Do you run and hide? Do you blame it? Self-improvement. When you smell the cesspool. You try real hard to not be depraved? Well, I just might as well get a Dixie cup and go to the ocean and start draining it. <laughs> Our indwelling sin should do the same thing to us that the law does to us. When Jesus bumped into self-righteous Pharisees, he basically, especially when they wanted to point to their behavior for their righteousness, they kind of wanted to play law. He said, hey, you want to play law? I'll play law with you. Don't steal. We don't steal. Swell, swell, swell. Well, don't even covet. Not only don't steal, let's take depravity deeper. Don't even look at what somebody has and want it. The purpose of that was to break them. It was not for them to go, okay, I don't steal, and okay, I'm going to try real hard not to covet. No, that wasn't the purpose of it. Don't commit adultery. We don't. Don't even look at a woman and ever want to. Don't kill. We don't. Don't even be mad with your brother. It was to take the wind out of your sails. <clears throat> Tell you, when you smell your cesspool, if that causes you to say, okay, I'm going to try harder, then you might as well just get a Dixie cup, drive to the ocean, and start draining. Because you're going to have more luck there than you are whipping your depravity by yourself. Finally, and this is my personal favorite. <laughs> Self-condemnation. When you smell your cesspool, just beat yourself up. Scorn yourself. Treat yourself with contempt. Say edifying things like, and you call yourself a Christian? My wife and I had a wonderful conversation. One of the most significant we've had in a long time this week. Because she knows what her pattern is when she smells her cesspool. Her pattern is to just shame herself. Shame herself, shame herself. And what it ends up doing is just shutting herself down. And she gets stuck in her depravity. 
That's what condemning yourself will do to you. Just, you just get stuck there. Well, let me close with something you already know. But I'm not asking you if you know it. I'm asking you how, how fresh is it to you? When's the last time you experienced it? You know what God's strategy for your depravity is? It's called Calvary. It's called Calvary. Do you know you need forgiveness as much as you need oxygen? <clears throat> Folks, I'm not talking past tense. We can identify a lot of this better with the past tense than we can today, can't we? Yeah, the cross. Yeah, the cross. Yeah, the cross. Today, the cross. When you smell that cesspool, God's design is not that you run and hide, blame it on somebody else, try to improve yourself, or beat yourself up. It's to take your cesspool to the cross and stay there for a while until you hear him say, that's why I died, David. You are forgiven. You are forgiven. You are forgiven. Don't bother me with that anymore. Go on out and play. Go on out and play. You know that night when I lost the battle with lust? I did the first John 1 9. It didn't help much. I was so devastated. You know what I needed, even as a good Baptist? I needed a priest. And so wait a minute, don't you believe in the priesthood of the believer? Yeah. But I also believe in James 5, 16, confess your sins one to another and pray. You'll be healed. I needed healing that night. Sin had ripped a hole in my soul. And I called up a friend of mine who's a safe person. He was a priest to me that night. And I handed him, in a metaphorically speaking, I handed him my heart. 11.30. No, later than that, whenever, 3.30. Called him up and said, Dave, he happens to be my senior pastor, which is interesting. But light years beyond that, he happens to be a brother and a friend. He said, David, I just turned on the television, watched the vilest, most horrible movie I've ever seen. I asked God to forgive me, and I'm laying in a bed of shame, and I'm stuck. And over the phone, life and death was in the power of his tongue. And my friend said, well, he knew I was broken. Now, if he thought I was playing games with him, he'd have been on me like a shirt. Because you know what? He wants me to finish the race. He'd have caught a plane and been in my face in my, in my bedroom if he'd have thought I was dodging the truth and playing games. But he knew he had a broke he he knew he had a broken reed on the phone and a smoking flax. And when I put my heart in his hands, he said, I got three things I want to say to you, David. He said, Sam. He said, number one is I want to say to you, I believe you're a godly man. And I began to sob like a child. Because I had an awful hard time letting that in. Do you know real, real godly men sometimes do real, real depraved things? you believe that? He said, I believe you're a godly man. And he said, the second thing I want to say to you is put the club down. I can hear you, I can hear you beating yourself up from here. 
try to lay the club down. And then the third thing he said to me as my priest, and it was the voice of God in the voice of a man. He said, you are forgiven. You are forgiven. You are forgiven. And folks, I don't know if you can believe this or track with me, but as deeply as I had experienced my depravity that night, I experienced Calvary all over again. And the grace of God affected me deeper still than even my depravity. And do you know, for the rest of the night, I didn't go to sleep. And yet I wasn't laid and paralyzed in a bed of shame. You know what I was doing? I was worshiping God probably more significantly than I worshiped God in my whole life. Because I got a glimpse of grace in the midst of my depravity. Do you know for our good news to be really good, the bad news has to be really bad? You know why people ho hum and yawn through the doxology? They've not tasted their depravity and they've not freshly tasted Calvary. How about you? As we leave tonight, the questions are, how long has it been since you've gone down with the count because you smelled your cesspool? You know, for some of you, you are so sensitive to God that when you smell your cesspool immediately, you just beat yourself like crazy. And you probably don't need to, you certainly don't need to stay focused on your cesspool. As one of my friends says, for every one, t one look at depravity, take 10 looks at the cross. But you know what I know about some of you? You ain't that sensitive. And you might need to spend some time around your cesspool. Because it's been a while since you've been crushed by your own stuff. And you minister harshly to your people. You're not gentle. You're self-righteous. You've forgotten what it's like to be a sinner. We close with a quote. From Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He who is alone with his sins is utterly alone. It may be that Christians, notwithstanding corporate worship, common prayer, and all their fellowship and service, may still be left to their loneliness. The final breakthrough to fellowship does not occur because though they have fellowship with one another as believers and as devout people, they do not have fellowship as undevout, as sinners. The pious fellowship permits no one to be a sinner. So everyone must conceal his sin from himself and from their fellowship. We dare not be sinners. Many Christians are unthinkably horrified when a real sinner is suddenly discovered among the righteous. So we remain alone with our sin, living in lies and hypocrisy. The fact is, we are sinners. Where do you need to spend more time tonight? At the cross or at the cesspool? That's a strange statement, isn't it? You bow your heads with me just for a minute as we close. Our focus is restoring our spiritual passion. How does that happen? Well, we need to experience some things. What do we need to experience? 
You need to experience our depravity. We need to experience Calvary. I mean, say, David, if I'm honest, this is not a come forward time. This is just a put a hand on your heart time. I mean, say, David, if I'm being honest with you, it's been a while since I think I've really, really seen my cesspool. It's been a while since I've been attentive to my inner cesspool, and I, maybe God's agenda for me is to take kind of a fresh look at my depravity. Pray for me. Would you just slip up your hand if you're, that's where you are? Thanks. Thank you. I want to encourage you to ask the Holy Spirit to be your guide there. He won't leave you there. He won't leave you stuck in the cesspool. He won't. But he'll let you see enough of it that it'll humble you. And it'll break you. And it'll stagger you. But it'll free you. And it'll make you gentle. I mean, say, David, I think my bigger need for me, that's got my name on it, is uh, it's been a while since I've freshly tasted Calvary. I, I'm aware of my cesspool. Matter of fact, I'm so aware of it, I think about dropping out all the time. I need a fresh taste of Calvary. I need to hear the Lord say to me, you're forgiven. You're forgiven. Would you just slip up your hand if that's where you're at? That's neat. We'll ask him for that because he'll, he'll, he'll do that for you. I just want to read this over you, and then we're done. Four years ago in a large city in the far west, rumors spread that a certain Catholic woman was having visions of Jesus. The reports reached the archbishop. He decided to check her out. There's always a fine line between the authentic mystic and the lunatic fringe. Is it true, ma'am, that you've had visions of Jesus? asked the cleric. Yes, the woman replied simply. Well, the next time you have a vision, I want you to ask Jesus to tell you the sins that I confessed in my last confession. The woman was stunned. Did I hear you right, Bishop? You actually want me to ask Jesus to tell me the sins of your past? Exactly. Please call me if anything happens. Ten days later, the woman notified her spiritual leader of a recent recent apparition. Please come, she said. Within the hour the Archbishop arrived, he trusted eye-to-eye contact. You just told me on the telephone you actually had a vision of Jesus. Did you do what I asked? Yes, Bishop. I asked Jesus to tell me the sins you confessed in your last confession. The bishop leaned forward with anticipation. His eyes eyes narrowed. What did Jesus say? She took his hand and gazed deeply into his eyes. Bishop, she said, these are his exact words. I can't remember. Christianity happens when men and women accept the unwavering trust that their sins have not only been forgiven, but forgotten, washed away in the blood of the Lamb. A sad Christian is a phony Christian, one man said, and a guilty Christian is no Christian at all. Hmm. Well, Lord, I, I've longed to be a pair of pants and a start shirt that your spirit would have access through, and I trust you with whatever results would happen. Thank you for every need in my life. Thank you for every weakness. Thank you for every broken place. Thank you for every bloody place. Thank you even for every failure that continues to cast me onto your grace, that you are my only hope for righteousness, for sanctification, for service, for finishing well, for praying well. You're our only hope. You're my only hope. Holy Spirit, guide these folks in the, in the areas where they need to walk. You want to freshly affect them. You want to impassion them with you and your truth. For those that need a fresh awareness of their cesspool, I pray you bring it to them. I know you will. Not just to cause them pain, but to bring them life. For those that need a fresh touch of Calvary, because they're aware, they're, they're, they're nostril deep in their cesspool. It's overwhelming, I pray, that in ways that I don't even understand, you could lead them to Calvary and let them sit in the grass for a while until they really hear in their heart of hearts, you are forgiven. It is forgotten. 
going out and play. Lord, we're here to just let you do a work in our hearts. I believe you are. And I believe you will. In Jesus' name, amen.